I'm going to discuss the free procession of a disc. Here's a cartoon of my disc. The disc has three principal moments of inertia, the largest of which is shown here by the vector E3 hat. Now in general, the rotation vector, little omega, does not have to run parallel to the E3 vector. So this can give rise to an angular momentum vector, which doesn't point parallel to any principal axes of inertia. In the body frame, moments of inertia are given by lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. The moments lambda 1 and lambda 2 are equal and approximately equal to a quarter m r squared, while the third moment, the largest moment, is a half m r squared. With those moments, I get an angular momentum vector that looks like this where omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 are the three components of the rotation vector in the body frame, so the frame attached to the rotating disk. Now because we have no torques, that is this is free precession, in the inertial frame not attached to the disk, the change in the angular momentum vector with time should be zero. And we can use our rotational dynamics equation to relate that to the change in the angular momentum vector as seen in the rotating frame of the disk. And what we end up with are three equations expressing the time derivatives of the three components of the rotation vector in the body frame, so in the frame attached to the disk. The component along the largest moment, that's constant, while the other two are coupled in a way that when you take a second time derivative, you find that those other two components just oscillate with a frequency what I call capital omega b. Capital omega b is shown below, and for the case of a disk, we find that omega b has a magnitude which is just omega 3, so that's just the angular velocity vectors component along the E3 three axis. But of course, since the axes attached to the disks themselves are rotating, in a space frame, that is in an inertial frame, the angular velocity vector will appear to rotate with an angular rotation vector big omega s, which works out to be about twice the rotation component along the third principal axis, along the third moment of inertia shown there. And so let's actually test to see whether we can see that in a simple case. So here's my disk. You can see I've marked uh, sort of a radial uh, vector here with a thick black marker so we can track the rotation of the disk about its largest principal axis. What we're expecting to see is that the disk is going to process, basically it's going to wobble with a frequency twice the frequency of the rotation of the disk about its third principal moment. So what we're looking for is a wobble uh, that goes twice as fast as the rotation of the disk about the third principal moment. Let's go see if we can see that. Here I am holding the disk with the thick black mark pointed toward the camera. The plane of the disk is tilted a bit to the right. I'll throw the disk off to the left. Here, the thick black mark is at the back of the disk, meaning a half of a rotation has been completed, but the plane of the disk has begun to tilt to the right again, meaning that the one processional cycle has occurred while only one half rotation cycle has occurred. A little hard to tell here, but the black mark has returned to the front of the disk again, meaning one rotation cycle has completed since I launched the disk originally. At the same time, the plane of the disk has begun to tilt to the right, meaning another processional cycle has occurred. So two procession cycles for one rotation cycle, consistent with our expectations. Drawing a frisbee without any wobble is actually quite difficult, but it can be a significant advantage in a sport involving frisbee throwing. Wobble can induce turbulence, which induces drag, and reduces the travel distance of a thrown frisbee. Famously, physicist Richard Feynman's Nobel Prize winning work on quantum electrodynamics was inspired by watching the procession of a frisbee thrown across a Cornell cafeteria.